And thanks everyone for joining today. I'm Becky Madden with UVM Extension, and this is the first in our webinar series for the spring of 2023. Really excited for this lineup. Today is our crop by crop speed share. And just a few Zoom protocol reminders to keep yourself muted. And um, again, we are recording this. It'll be posted for on the VVBGA or the UVM Hort website. We'll send a link later. Um, if you want to put your name and your farm name in the chat, just so we can all introduce each other quickly, that'd be great. And you can use the chat for questions or the raise hand function. And we will um, hold most of the questions till the end because this is a, a speed sharing. And each presenter is going to have just under 10 minutes to share their specifics of their crops. And then we'll have time at the end to discuss. And we can hang out a little after 1 o'clock if people want to keep chatting. So I'm going to get going with um, our lineup is Ryan Fitzbosham from Evening Song Farm. And I know you have to hop off, Ryan. So I'm going to um, get going with you right away. OK, Ryan, over to you. Thanks, Becky. So I'm going to be talking about baby lettuce production. Our farm is about four acres, and we do one third wholesale, two thirds CSA. Baby lettuce is the crop that we distribute the most of, both through CSA and for wholesale. So it's um, the biggest crop that we grow, and also one of my favorites. What I really like about baby lettuce is that. There's very little pest pressure. It's um, limited to slugs when it's really wet and some aphids in the greenhouse. But other than that, there's really not much that we deal with for pests. And same with diseases, a, a little bit of soil-borne disease that we might have when it's um, really hot in the summer, but um, really very little for pest and disease problems with lettuce. The trick for baby lettuce that we found is the weed management. So you can see on, um, if you go back one, the, um, there's an overhead view of our farm. In that photo, you can see we've got a lot of tarps out on our fields. This photo is from early June. And so tarping is our main strategy for weed management for baby lettuce. And um, if you go to the next slide. This is a little, the, in, you know, along with tarps, one of the biggest tools that we use for weed management is crop rotation. And so for when we grow, when we decide where we're going to grow baby lettuce, we're not looking so much at what was grown there before as we are looking at the, um, at the weed, what the weed seed bank is in that soil. So if you go to the, I'm seeing the overhead um, photograph, if you go to the next one with the spreadsheet. So this is a little snippet of our, uh, our field map that we have information for each of our fields, so soil test information, what we grew there the year before, we update as we, as we plant. And then sometime during the growing season, I just write some notes in there about what um, I expect the weed seed bank to be in that soil. So in this particular, it says high annual pressure, tarp and flame after warm season weed seed germination. So for each of the fields, I know what to expect as far as the weeds, that, the annual weed seeds that will emerge there and any perennial weed problems that we have. And so since baby lettuce is one of the things where we kind of look to the fields where we expect to have pretty good weed control and try to utilize those fields since um, we're not controlling weeds through cultivation. So to prepare a field for planting, the, um, we'll put down, put down fertilizer, incorporate with a power harrow. And um, if you go, I think you went back, if you go forward a couple. Incorporate fertilizer with a power harrow. We used to use a rototiller to prepare our fields. And I found using a rototiller, it created the conditions where we had a lot of annual weed seed pro proliferation. And we just, it was harder for us to get a stale seed bed because we weren't able to limit the depth of our tillage. I really like the power harrow that we have because we can set the depth to just one or two inches and disturb the soil just enough to, um, to make a seed bed without pulling up weed seeds that might be buried. And then I think, um, yeah, if there's, it's rare that our soil is pretty heavy, so it's rare that we have a lack of moisture in the soil. But once our field is prepared and ready to plant or ready to tarp, um, if it's if it is dry conditions like this, we'll irrigate so that when the tarp is on, the weeds will um, we can have some germination of those weed seeds under the tarp. And so this is what the tarps that we use. We don't use silage tarps. These are um, uh, a woven fabric, 
It's called UltraWeb. It can be purchased through Notes Greenhouse Supplies. The larger sizes, this is 40 by 120. The larger sizes like this can't be, I don't think they're in the catalog, but if you, you can, they can get them for you if you ask. What I like about these is that they're permeable. So um, they don't pool water like silage tarps do. And they're a whole lot easier to move. They're a little lighter weight than landscape fabric as well. They're 2.2 ounces per square yard instead of 3.1 like, like a regular landscape fabric. So this is me uh, getting ready to move one of these tarps by myself. It's a, a pretty easy thing for one person to do. It's, if you have two people, that's nice, but it's, um, it's not hard for one person to just bunch this up in the middle, roll it up and um, load it on the pallet of the tractor, as long as it's in the middle of the day and the dew has dried off of it. Um, so they last a lot of years and um, I, I've tried silage tarps on our farm that find these a whole lot easier for tarping and just as effective. So this is after we tarp a zone for at least two weeks, we take the tarp off. And then we do, what I found when we started using tarps is that I was kind of discouraged because we still had weeds coming up after we took the tarp off. And I came to the conclusion that removing the tarp from an area is another, is, is a factor that stimulates weed seed germination because it seemed like we would get a flush of weeds after germinating. So we plan our tarping and tarp removal so that we're removing it seven to 10 days before we're ready to seed. And then right before seeding, we'll run a flame weeder over that area to kill any of those little weeds that come up in the flush from tarp removal. And that usually gives us a pretty, a pretty good stale seed bed. Um, we might also run the power hair over that zone pretty shallowly. We seed with a Yang seeder. We use roller XY24, uh, front sprocket 11, rear sprocket 13 and we'll seed rows about four inches apart, um, eight, eight or 10 rows per bed. And I forgot to put the varieties in here, but we'd use um, sycamore is a variety that we do that's available through Osborne. And that's a really nice tango leaf variety that, um, that I like really, that I like produces a lot. We also do clear water and galactic. Um, and then irrigate after planting. And then, um, as bef oh, this is what we're yeah this is what we're looking for this is this is arugula germinating here but we're looking for really nice strong germination of course with um, with very little weed seeds coming up with it and then when the crops as the lettuce is growing this is um, this is a little weedier than than we like um, but still manageable we we usually do a single hand weeding on um, or we try to do a single hand weeding and if we have a pretty good stale seed bed then that's pretty minimal and it takes about one person, one or two people an hour to um, to weed a hundred foot bed. Um, but you know, you can see here there's a couple a couple of fall panicum coming up um, that's ideal to pull at this stage before the lettuce gets much bigger. And then when we get to harvest, we use the quick cut greens harvester. If we have done a good job with weed control, this makes harvest really fast and easy. If we um, if we haven't gotten to do that hand weeding on a bed. What's nice is that we're still able to, to go through and cut with a knife, which is a little bit slower, but, um, but still works well on our scale. And I think that is it uh, for baby lettuce. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was great. Um, we're gonna, on the theme of Ryan's and greens, we are gonna switch over to Ryan Demaris from Naked Acre Farm. So take it away. Ryan, number two. All right, great. Thanks, Becky. Um, thanks for putting this on and thanks for having us too. Um, so there's going to be a lot of uh, kind of crossover between what Ryan just said and this Ryan saying this similar things. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm kind of in the midst of switching things over uh, as far as bed prep, but typically uh, what I do is go in with a uh, kind of a, a mini chisel. It's got five shanks on it. That's in that top left picture there. And just kind of um, loosen up the soil to, you know, it's about 10 to 18 inches. Uh, and then I put down about half of the soil racks from the UVM soil test that I do, usually in the fall. Uh, sometimes this spring um, and this past year I just had to do uh, nitrogen because uh, everything else looked pretty good um, so I just do about half and then I shape the bed with a leshy bed shaper it's 42 inch tops roughly um, but like I said I'm, I'm considering switching over to permanent beds because the beds out there right now are tarped and they were formed they were shaped 
the season before, the spring before, and I'm going to see um, what kind of shape they're in in the spring and see if I can use those. Um, and then after, I usually keep all the arugula, mixed greens, lettuce, all that stuff in the same block. And so I just can I just flip beds in that block for the whole season. And so by the second or third succession, uh, what I do is I come in with the BCS, I flail mow, and then I I have a um, a PDR for the BCS, which is precision depth roller. It basically takes the place of a um, power harrow. And I set it at about two or three inches and do two passes on the bed. And then I tarp it for at least three weeks. Uh, I do some silage tarps and then some of the ultra web that Ryan was talking about. Uh, but I've found some, it's not, it doesn't really work as well. You get one good flush of weeds, like Ryan said. And then if you disturb the soil at all, it just, there's a whole other flush of weeds that you get. So I'm still trying to perfect that uh, system. This is an older picture, but uh, that's kind of what it looks like at the end. I use a, uh, the Jang, the fibro, and the sprockets are set at whatever they were when I got them. I haven't messed with those at all. Um, I use X24 rollers and um, it's all Astro arugula. Um, so I get 15 rows per bed because I do three passes on the 42 inch top there and it, it manages to fit pretty nicely. Um, and then in the summer, um, what I do is I alternate the hoppers. So every other hopper is empty. And so, and then the middle row has the two middle hoppers. So then there's extra space between them uh, because arugula is really finicky at my farm. Um, and it's really diseasey, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and so I water everything in with wobblers. Uh, those are every 21 feet. And, um, and then I recover after they're watered in, I recover with the silage sharps. I try and get the white side up, but oftentimes it's the black side. And usually I get germination in about 48 hours um, or sometimes less in the summer. And then I hoop and use the 14 foot width protect net to cover two beds at a time. Uh, next slide, yep. And so harvesting, uh, I, I use a lot of sandbags. And so I go down a row and take off all the sandbags, pull the protect net over, cut everything with the greens cutter. Uh, into those standard totes and then I pull the row cover back put all those handbags back and then when I get them up to the wash pack I just kind of spritz the toe with a little water and, and they go right into the cooler right away and then there that's uh, I didn't have many pictures of the finished speed queen that was me kind of converting it and then that's lettuce in the in the baskets but um, that's that's basically what it looks like the same um, with arugula, I find that it bruises very easily. And so I put in only about a quarter. So it takes a really long time to spin all the arugula because I only put in about a quarter full of the baskets and I place it in like very gently into the bottom. So there's not any, or there's less opportunity to get, um, get bruised because I see, see that a lot. Um, and then from the Speed Queen, it goes right into three pound cases for wholesale restaurants. And then um, into gray totes, clean totes, uh, which we will fill our retail bags out of uh, later on in the day. Uh, some upgrades I'm considering. I bought a, a three, 300 gallon stainless tank, like an old maple container, and I'm going to build a new bubbler um, for that because I think it'll be, it'll add a little more volume. Um, otherwise, if you're coming in with multiple totes, the system that I have now, I can only do like two totes, two and a half totes at a time. So I want to um, upgrade that. And having a finished wash pack too would be helpful. Um, so this is pests and diseases that we deal with. Becky, you can hit the thing like a million times um, if it's gonna work. So pests, really the only pests are flea beetle, but the protect net does a pretty good job with that. Um, and then these are multiple different types of diseases <laughs> that I've dealt with. You can see, I send all these pictures to and hazel rig a bunch of times and uh, tried to figure out what different things were. A lot of root rot, uh, fusarium root rot was a big thing. Uh, we have a lot of rhizoctonia present in our soil. Um, so that affects a lot of the arugula growth too. Some downy mildew, bacteria leaf spot. 
Um, I think a lot of that stuff, you could use preventative measures, uh, doing treatment of seeds, whether it's a bleach treatment or hot water. I haven't done anything with that yet. I'd like to though. Um, and oftentimes I just kind of till it in, walk away and say, screw it and try again the next week because I seed it every week. So yay, more pictures. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks, Ryan. That's, that's great. Um... Okay, so Jenica, who also farms at Naked Acre, but grows flowers, is gonna share um, her. There you go. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, hi, I'm Jenica Breitenbeck, um, and I actually am off farm primarily. So I'm probably on the farm about maybe eight to 12 hours a week, because um, I have a gardening business and I'm out and about in the county. Um, tending to other gardens. So pretty much what I have is um, I've got about 350 square feet in this big house, um, just in two beds. And I used to grow a lot more outside doing cut flowers, but I downsized to just edibles. Um, so this was a couple years ago. We now have the Rows are not just full of grass, but um, have some fabric down. Um, but typical bed prep, I might do a light tillage after adding compost or something like uh, wood chips or peat to the soil. Um, but basing that off of soil tests. Um, for new beds, I'll be transitioning this year to uh, 54 by 16 foot uh, like farmer's friend, tiny house. And um, so that'll be all new beds coming out of turf. Um, so I'll be tarping and probably use it later in the, in the summer for that last succession. Um, but we pretty much, I'm just using um, amendments, right? Any kind of pelletized pro grow or, or such I'm using right at transplant. So I'm not feeding grass and uh, sheep sorrel, which is our other real persistent friend in this house. Um, so typical practices, put down drip irrigation. And I, especially if I'm outside, I will mulch with straw, which you can see in this photo here. Um, Cause especially on short plants, um, there's splashback and it's almost impossible to get off unless it's the perfect flower with um, a paintbrush, which is doable, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, so planting and spacing is really gonna be based on your crop selection. And it's, you know, typically eight or 12 inches in a grid over a 30 or 42 inch bed. And um, it's, you know, sometimes they'll squeeze them a little closer. I find that if I'm trying to get cut stems out of them as well. I will do them closer just to get a length out of it. Um, but either way, it's pretty successful. 30 inch bed is nice because it's much easier to reach into the bed and get as much crop out as possible without um, either damaging plants or stepping into the bed. Um, but pretty typical, some support if needed be. But so when it comes to harvesting, it's Cleanliness first, especially because this is basically a finished product that is going to be going from my packaging almost directly to the plate. Um, and so ideal time is when it's cool because both the flowers are going to be their nicest quality and the, any insects on them will be quiet and still um, because and hopefully before any insects really um, land on the flowers. Just always trying to get um, the flowers before there's any pollen drop so that they're fully open so that the chefs can use them, but before they're getting um, inundated and pollinated because that will decrease shelf life or, you know, storage life significantly. Um, I try to just uh, kind of sort things because what I do is I'm creating a mix almost exclusively for chefs. And um, so I'm gonna kind of have them so I can then quickly go through them to package. Yeah, if I 
am doing it the night before. If I have a lot of big orders, I will only do that with certain flowers such as calendula or marigold, kind of the sturdiest flowers and um, just get them in the cooler as soon as possible. Um, and then typically I will be deadheading generally from a Wednesday or Thursday harvest. I'll be deadheading over the weekend. Um, so then I'll have a nice fresh flush the following week. Um, so for post-harvest, I am really, uh, I have a little setup on my, my table in the wash pack with a whiteboard you can see there. And I'm, I uh, sell these by account, um, which can generally coordinate to a weight as well, but um, that's kind of chef dependent. And, um, but I'm again, keeping them cool until ready to pack. I generally am trying to uh, evenly distribute the highest quality uh, ones to uh, the chefs and um, based on certain, you know, quality requirements that each of them have, I'll be uh, choosing individual flowers, which sounds, it's, sounds time consuming, but it, it, it's actually not that bad because I know who I'm selling to. Um, and essentially, uh, here's where like having really paying really close attention to who is in or on the flowers. We have a lot of slugs here and they find their way into all the little grooves of everything. So I have to, you know, really pay attention in the deep flowers like nasturtium or snaps gently open them up, make sure there aren't any bumblebees or other critters in there. And um, and yeah, there's some interesting larvae that are always on calendula, just things to pay attention to because my customers really don't want any uh, insects on their, on their product. Um, and yeah, pretty typical, just date them, label them, keep the heavy stuff on the bottom. Um, next slide. And I guess my final thoughts, I, every year, especially with access to ornamentals, I'm always wondering like, oh, is this edible? So I'll just experiment. And I always have experiments going um, with, uh, in pots in the greenhouse typically, and see which ones I'll do a lot of research, make sure there's no strange chemicals um, that could be detrimental to people. And um, yeah, the, the idea is, uh, you can click the next one, Becky. Um, know your customers to keep them happy, which might not be too hard for this particular guy, but um, yeah, and also enjoy what you're doing. So click again and um, yeah, experiment in the in your own home and go to your chefs and, and see what they're doing with all your stuff. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jenica. That's great. That makes me really want some flowers right now. <laughs> um, so our next presenter also talking about flowers is Jesse Witcher from Understory Farm. And um, she chose Snapdragons and you should be good to go, Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Sorry. One, hi. <laughs> also, hi, Jenna It's nice to meet you on Zoom, at least. I know we've emailed before, but it's nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about snapdragons. Um, and I learned the Latin pronunciation is anturinum, which I've been saying wrong for many years, but I thought I'd look it up. Um, next slide. These are going to go pretty fast, Becky. I just have a couple, like one thing to say about each slide. So we grow three different varieties. Um, and two rounds in tunnels, a fall and early spring, three rounds out in the field. Um, we grow, so we basically always have snapdragons and that's because they um, work in all of our different sales outlets, whether it's our flower share. Uh, we sell a ton wholesale um, to both to the wholesaler and to designers and they work in all of our mixed bunches. So just they're like tall, sturdy, great colors all around works. Um, this is a Chantilly, so they have an open face and they only grow well when the days are shorter and cooler. So it's, they're called group one. Um, and so greenhouse only. Next slide. The, this is called Madam Butterfly. These ones are like a double azalea type. 
Um, so they're kind of fancy and our wholesaler doesn't get them in um, from other growers. So even though they're like smaller than other Snapdragons they get, they really like them because they look kind of fancy and we can grow them all year. I mean, except in the winter. <laughs> and then this is a variety Potomac, which is more like your traditional Snapdragon where if you squeeze it, the little mouth opens, which is how they got their name. <laughs> um, and I love the colors of these. They're super um, sturdy and um, great vase life, really good flower, the Potomac series. Next, um, the seeds are super tiny and I haven't found them available pelleted. So we use this cedar and um, we either use, okay, that's, that's all I had for that slide. We either use um, the 200 cells, which you can see in this one, or the next slide, Becky, or we use the row trays. And it kind of just depends on who's seeding, like what their preference is, um, and also what, what we're going to do with it. Um, if we're gonna plant them straight out into the greenhouse, we will often use like 200s. Um, if they're growing out in the field, we might pot them up to 72s and just give them a little more space. Um, we use this grow chamber to put them in, which is an old luggage airport luggage cart thing. Oh wait, back. Um, and then a water, a backpack sprayer. So the, the seeds don't get blown out. We also like pat, like after I seed, I press the soil down and cover with vermiculite, which they need a lot of flower seeds actually are tiny like this and needs uh, light to germinate. And so we've found that method to be a good way to keep them a little covered, um, and not have them just like blow out when you get, when you water them right away. So next, um, for our tunnels, we use a BCS. We use just a balanced pelleted fertilizer um, from the Creare and we did it at Laws. Um, and then some tunnels we have had to add potassium phosphate and then we use blood meal if it needs a little more nitrogen. And then we'll fertigate during the season, but then we use a lower nitrogen, higher potassium to fertigate so that the, we don't, flowers won't bloom well if they get too much nitrogen once they start flowering. So uh, we also use regular Neptune, like the balanced one, the liquid when we're for all of our transplants on the farm, and then also use some biofungicides, which I have there when we transplant. Um, we use pre-burn landscape fabric for our greenhouse beds. So um, six beds in each greenhouse, they're um, 30 by 72 beds or greenhouses, tunnels, um, five rows, nine inches apart. Uh, we pinch the plants when they get to be about four inches high. Um, that way you get like, um, like five medium um, like average size stems that are all kind of the same versus like one giant one and then a bunch of little ones after you pick the giant one. Um, if we want a faster crop in the greenhouse, we will sometimes plant at six inches apart and not pinch. We use this Horta Nova netting and for in the greenhouses because things just get more heavy robust, we use the posts at four feet apart and um, yeah, fiberglass posts with the insulators. So think like electric fencing for animals. We had it left over from when we used to raise pigs and it works great for flowers because then you can just lift it um, as the plants grow. You, the insulators slide right on the fiberglass posts, but we do use wooden posts um, on either end for extra support. For our field production, we usually do a cover crop and then if it's like really established, Gregory will plow it in. Um, otherwise just wait till it winter kills and then disc it in. And next we use oats and peas. That's a common one, but you also do like buckwheat and other things. Gregory's kind of the cover crop boss. So <laughs> um, we disc it in, in the spring. Um, so we do have a cult of mulcher too, if we feel like the disking isn't doing the job. Then we use, we have this awesome piece of equipment that lays our um, biodegradable plastic mulch. It lays fertilizer and our drip tape. Um, so yeah, we use about three pounds of that fertilizer per acre, but sometimes that's what, that's the most the hopper can lay. And sometimes we feel like depending on the field, it might need a little more. So Gregory will broadcast more. Then we transplant. Like I said, we put the Neptune right in the transplanter. Um, 
and then we transplant them out, the snapdragons out um, in the field. And in the field, they go um, 12 inches apart, three rows per bed. And that's pretty much like what we do everything in the field as is this point, either everything's 12 inches apart, either two rows or three rows. We also use the Horta Nova in the field and the same posts, but we can space them farther apart in the field. And we always pinch them in the field because they're so far apart. We can get more cuts. That's it, that's all I had. Any questions? Thanks, Jesse. That was like an entire um, flower growing <laughs> seminar. <laughs> really awesome short time. Um, John, I assume you're going to share your screen or last presenter. Okay. I don't, I don't have any pictures. We're doing this without pictures. I got nothing oh, for great. you today. <laughs> Go for it. So I'll talk. Yep. Talk away. Um, and you. sorry about, sorry about that, but I made it here. That was enough. Uh, <laughs> so, um, we're going to talk about onions a little bit. And if I have a minute, we can talk about leeks. Um, we do, uh, all of our onions on some on plastic and some on bare ground. We'll talk about that second. Um, we all of our uh, onions on plastic. So we're doing uh, red wings, red onions. We're doing, um, um, hang on, I thought I made a list here, um, but I'll get back to the varieties in a second here. But so starting everything at a 128, we have gotten down to doing um, all of our single seeds, single cells in our 128s. And that's because we're sell we're now no longer bunching onions for market for retail. We're doing single onions and selling them that way. So uh, we have found what sells better is a much larger onion. Um, and so all of our our reds, yellows, and our sweet onions are all done as singles in our 128s. We're using uh, Fort V to start. Uh, we start usually first week in March. Um, we only trim once through that. We're also doing, so we're doing about, for plastic, about 5,000, pre preferably pelleted wherever possible so we can start with vacuum seeding. Um, so we're also doing all of our, we do a batch of shallots on plastic as well. We were using Prisma, uh, currently not available. They were getting the biggest again. Wholesale accounts uh, just want, these things in much bigger sizes as well. So about 90 trays of uh, shallots on plastic. Um, everything is, uh, our fields are all, uh, we make our own compost. We also have uh, cow manure delivered that we're making compost from. And we spread all of our fields early in the season from compost we've made the season before. And then when we're laying our plastic for, we do all of our uh, onions on plastic, we're doing a, um, a, a five, four, three careers that we're laying down prior to um, our seeding, our, our direct transplanting. And then all of that transplanting, we use a, um, we have a, a dibbler that is four across and it, it, we can adjust a little bit, but it's covering the bed four across and then six inches in row. Uh, and we, our beds are probably, I want to say 400 feet long, and it's all hands on deck to get our alliums onto plastic. Um, post that for maintenance, we are, I, I would say, one of the bigger challenges, certainly even on plastic, is weeding, especially with the alliums, because there's no canopy cover to keep the weed suppression. So we try to get one good hard hit and then maybe one more maintenance weeding throughout the course of the season. Um, trying to think, we don't do, uh, just, Wonder if we, we do some on our, our plastic, we do some um, fertigation irrigation later on, but very little for onions. We try to preload all the nitrogen up front so we're not um, seeing the later on when the bulbing is occurring. Um, so, one of the things is that as soon as bulbing starts to occur, we increase our watering. Uh, we'll actually let our water run for uh, the drip for 12 to 24 hours once a week on the onions and we found that makes a significant difference in the size the sizing up at that time for maintenance for pests uh thrips is our biggest problem we try to alternate now uh a year on year off of using entrust and then we also Pygatic, but it's not making as much of a difference. We have seen over the past five years that alternating, we are having less thrip pressure, but it still, uh, you can tell pretty quickly when you're 
uh, the leaves are starting to curl. But by that point, it's usually pretty late. So we, we're doing, we have now a, um, a spray schedule that we maintain uh, and trying to identify them. They're a little harder to identify. So we have a calendar of where we're expecting to see them. Uh, for botrytis, which is the other problem we have, we will start a spraying of probably two to three applications of copper. And that seems to do fairly well. I would say we're still seeing some disease. Um, all of those, uh, um, that are, that are, all of our alliums that are on plastic, um, we're probably starting to pick late June and then all the way through until tops start to drop. So we'll probably get four weeks of picking on plastic, carries us. Usually it backs up to our, our direct seeded stuff. Uh, and most of that's going to retail. The wholesale will start to occur for drying down. So everything gets harvested, brought into a greenhouse. We just drop right on the floor. Uh, we have a a retail greenhouse that we pull everything out of a, a 96 by 30 uh, and we put everything into 20 bushel bins, picking them out of the field, bringing them in there, trying to lay them out as quickly as possible, get seven days of dry down. And then um, after that, putting things into uh, um, bowl boxes to try to get topped as quickly as possible. Sometimes just, I mean, the volume is pretty big and we can't, takes quite a while to get the, these things topped and then into back into bins for storage. So sometimes you get, you know, sometimes the tops are getting a little bit snotty from sitting into a, a box for a while before we can get them on to, uh, dry down onto the uh, greenhouse floor. So that's it, putting them into big back, once they're uh, topped with our uh, onion topper, they go back into, um, big 20 bushel bins, we'll put them in the barn for storage and selling throughout the winter. Uh, we can't do that with the sweet onions. Sweet onions are cannot go through the topper. They all get hand cut and same thing with the shallots. So it's again, it's a hand, all hands on deck, trimming them down and uh, getting them ready for storage. So that's uh, our alliums on plastic. And then um, probably 20 years ago, we started doing the same um, varieties, uh, but direct seeding them out in the field. So we are prepping our fields with compost. We have a, um, we make a 20 inch, 30 inch uh, bed top when we're forming with our beds. We have a custom bed former that we made ourselves. Uh, we're again, at that time, preloading with a Creers 543. We let the bed sit for, so we're into late April, uh, letting the bed sit for a week. Flame weeding, we direct seed as, as wherever we can. We try to use pelleted. We have a wizard vacuum seeder, which is set for uh, one and a quarter inches. And we're using that for all of our red onions, yellow onions, sweets. We do cipollinis and we do our shallots with the vacuum seeder. Um, and it it has a, I mean, size doesn't matter so much because the vacuum seeder has a, a range of sizes you could use that hold, as long as you're holding, uh, you're singulating your seed. So um, seeding, uh, again, if we have a flush of weeds, we might come back with another flame weed, if not running baskets. And after that, it is the challenge of keeping up with alliums out in the field all, all um, summer long. And the biggest challenge we have found is a couple of years back, we have a blind cultivator that's high enough not to be knocking the um, tops of the onions down before they're ready to be pulled out of the field. We wait till about, I would say, 50 to 70 percent of the tops start to drop. We have found that you can actually bring them in earlier than we had expected and start curing them down uh, to pretty successfully. And then that's the same thing. We're back into our greenhouses, drying them off. and. Um, topping and packing for winter. So that's my short and skinny on our, our, our onions. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, John. That was great. That's, again, it's like, should be taking full notes. You're writing a whole guide in a few minutes. Um, can open it up to questions. There's a few in the chat. And um, if anyone wants to raise hand or put more questions in the chat, um, or if you feel comfortable just unmuting and talking, um, we've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to answer Howard's question in a second here. I'm just going to look up varieties. 
Great. It looks like um, Jack is asking you also what temperature you use for storage of onions. Well, I'll start with that one. Um, unregulated, uh, we have a barn that uh, uh, a southeast facing uh, room in our barn that does warm up a little bit during the day. And I would say it probably goes from uh, in the daytime temperature, maybe 35 to 40 and nighttime, maybe 15 to 20. And that's it. And we're just putting them into, they're in bins. Um, and I, don't, I probably should look at the temperature in there, but we don't. So it's definitely dropping below freezing and the onions are doing fine. It's dry and it's very, very dry. So you're not managing the humidity or temperature in the barn? Not, a, not in that room. No, I, we haven't been. <laughs> we're just, I think we're, we're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you got through that really cold night okay with that, huh? We did, yes. Awesome. But I think it's because it warms up during the day and it holds some of that daytime temperature. All right, so we are looking at for uh, our yellow onions, we're on a Patterson. For our red onions, we're on Red Wing. Uh, for our oh, sweet onions, um, we did Alsa Craig for many years, but what we found was, and I'm looking for this onion here, expression, that the Alsas have a 30-day storage. And I just sold our last, uh, oh, probably 10 bags of expression uh, last week, which is a sweet onion. So we've switched over to all, all expression just because, because of that. It's a it's decent a onion. Um, so that's our three. Then we have, um, as I said, shallots. I'd have to go back and look again. There, nothing I've grown before. So it's not, um, I have no idea. We, we were really into the ones we were growing. So uh, I think that Howard has already covered the leek one, uh, but Megaton is gone. We loved it. But I will say we grew um, Comanche this year and it was not, at, they didn't get as uh, fat as the Megaton did, but they were amazing. It was the best leek crop we've ever seen. We had the highest yields from this two years in a row from Comanche. Um, I had talked to um, Adrian when she was at Vitalis. So we, we had done some trialing with it and we love it. So high yields, a uh, high percentage of, of sale of leeks. The only problem is it's like some of the open pollinators is that they are a little long. So if you're doing wholesale, uh, you know, if it, it's, it's more challenging to get it into the box size. So you're losing weight by cutting them down, but they were, I mean, you're getting a white shank that's probably a good eight, 16, 18 inches long with no covering. We're not covering our leaks. We're just doing direct seeded, uh, a direct transplant. There. So um, no, we don't have any purple. We haven't had any purple blotch problems. We haven't seen any leak moth problems. So we have other problems, <laughs> but, um, neither of those problems. And as I said, so the leeks, we do give a little bit more nitrogen a little bit later in the season. Um, maybe probably mid season, we're side dressing again with a five, side, with a five, four, three, um, because they are bulking up so late in the season and, um, and that not so many disease problems. And if we do have purple blotch, we're seeing minimum damage out there. That's, it's more, um, as I said earlier, I think, uh, Thrips is more of a problem for us in terms of just challenges we're, we're running into. Um, John, Lisa is asking why you grow onions on bare ground and plastic. Yes, a great question. So the plastic gets us early retail onions. It's just that we have the room, so we do enough so we can start wholesale earlier. So we capture the wholesale market much earlier. We're probably a month to six weeks ahead of where we'd be with our field onions. And our field onions, uh, you know, we can grow 30,000 pounds of onions <laughs> by direct seeding them. It's just, it's a direct seed. It's so much easier. We can get so much more volume and it's a volume game out there. Have you um, like penciled out, since I know you love to do this, but like the costs and like kind of, you know, what about weed control on the bare ground onions? Well, I have not done the, the cost ratio. I will say that the we're spending, I, I think personally, we're spending more time for less yields on plastic. If we can keep up with, um, you know, the, the problem is in an ideal world where, uh, so our cultivation is throwing some dirt. If you throw too much dirt and you bury your onions, 
uh, they don't dry down as well. So it is uh, keeping enough weeds down. And I say that because if you look at our onions every year, they're not weed free like many of our other crops. They are uh, free enough of weeds that we get decent yields from them. Great. So mm -hmm. at, at much cheap, I, I would say we're getting, for the ratio of what we're getting for the amount of time we're spending, we're making a lot more money on our direct seed than we are on our plastic. Um, and Lisa's also wondering what your first date to spray for botrytis is, or do you go by weather and scouting? Yeah, I'm not sure I know. I'd have to look. So, so the answer is both. I have, what we've done over the years is tracked. So we have a, what I would call a prophylactic spray schedule at this point. It doesn't mean we, we start spraying then, but on I have a, for the whole farm, I have a calendar of everything we spray for. And it's the earliest date possible and it kicks in. And then I go and I see how the crop is looking at that point and whether we're gonna begin. And we refresh the, uh, we'll just refresh the timer on it because we know that some point within that window, we're gonna have to spray. But the, the, the actual date, I think, um, and I want to say that we're probably for on onion for on plastic. We're probably looking at late June. Great, thanks. Um, are there questions for any of our other speakers? Everyone is still here Here's, except Ryan Fitzgerald. She's got, she's got one more question for Lisa. Does. Oh yeah, Lisa. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. <laughs> so, so 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 this was the first year we actually packed in lots and lots of leaks because we had the leaks did so well this year and we could not get them all out of the field in time we left some leaks in the field for the first time and um so we just brought them in so we've always had some leaks so we're still selling leaks right now uh at retail and they're they're not fun to clean up <laughs> but we are looking at possibly doing so we, we just what we've been doing is standing them vertical in a uh a 20 bushel bin and that we were hoping that not laying them down together, that would help to some extent. It didn't make as much of a difference, but there's still, I mean, we're still selling very viable leaks. There's just a lot of cleanup involved to get that down to that uh, core, what looks good. We probably have another week to go. And I'd say that's, we're running to the end here. So we are gonna try, we've talked about sand, uh, my, you know, the guys that work for me and my son, everybody works doing everything they can to not have to handle these things. So <laughs> everybody's all in favor of sand if it works or not. So that's where we're heading towards is for next year. But otherwise it's, uh, they do store, uh, we're storing at about 34 degrees, 90% uh, humidity. And like I said, we'll have one more week of uh, probably, I would say, so probably another 40 pounds of leaks to sell, which is fun for the market. Other questions? It's fine to still ask John questions too. <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure you guys know everybody's up for grabs right now. Um, I guess I had a question for Ryan Demarest about your arugula diseases. Um, if you've tried any sprays or like if you've, I mean, I know they're a huge challenge and what curious what you've tried, if any. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it was your recommendations like I think our first year here, I was having all that, those issues with the Rhizox stuff. And um, I remember, I think you and Vern both showed up and uh, we talked about hooping because I was using the regular, the, the um, you know, the, the 15 weight Agrabon there, uh, row cover. And that was really causing a lot of humidity and, and moisture problems underneath. So I switched to the protect net that seemed to help, but I mean, I haven't tried too much. Like I said in the slide, usually I just kind of say screw it and move on because I seed it every week. So I just, um, I usually, if I get a bad, bad, I just kind of get what I can get off it and then move on. Um, but I think what I'm going to do this year is more of the preventative stuff with some of this hot water treatment. I think I'm going to try the bleach treatment first, actually, um, just to see um, if that works. Although I hate using the bleach, but. Um, and then another thing is I'm, I'm switching up varieties. I was using Kitazawa for a long time and I have some old seed. Um, and I've been using that for multiple years. And so I'm going to do some trials with Johnny's and um, some other companies to see if there's any significant difference between the, the crops or the beds. Awesome. Um, there's a request to, to, for you to repeat your, um, and I can also post the slides, but could you maybe type in the chat if possible, your, Jang plate numbers, or you could tell me and I can type it in. 
Um, yeah, it's just uh, it's I use the JP five. I'll just type it in, and um, I think it's the X twenty four rollers. <clears throat> Ryan from Evening Song is gone, but I can pass along the questions you guys have for him, um, and get back to folks. Um, question from Seth Jacobs about compost and careers going down, and if any growers are having. Um, their phosphorus levels going up as a result of that. Um, does anyone want to speak to that or? I I can, uh, I use Jeru's for a couple seasons pretty heavily. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Becky, we worked on that together. Um, and I, the phosphorus is kind of right where it needs to be. So I haven't had put in, I haven't put any phosphorus down in the fields and uh, this will be the second year in a row. Uh, but it, it didn't get excessive. It got right where it needed to be. Yeah, I guess, Seth, I can, um, I think most of the growers who presented today are paying pretty close attention to their soil tests. It has been a problem historically, and I, um, you know, we have some speculations, but it definitely seems to climb quicker with the Jerus than it does with the careers in terms of like background levels of P accumulating, but um, yeah, I think, and then careers obviously have the different um, the different formulas you can reduce your phosphorus by using 822 or the 726 as well but definitely something i guess we're supposed to keep in mind um any other questions flower questions fun to hear about flowers um really huge thanks to the speakers for sharing i know it's a lot to put together a short presentation and just appreciate your time and generosity with all that so um, with that said, join us next week. We've got another round of this. And then um, following next week, we'll have some other um, great webinars. So thanks, everybody. Have a great sunny spring-like day.